Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today at Fluke Excelix webinars. I'm going to push us back on pause for just one moment while we wait for everyone to arrive. So stay with us. And hello again. This is Leah Freeberg with Fluke Excelix. We are going to give it a slow get going as people join us. I'll do a little bit of, of introduction at the top. You probably know Fluke as a test tool provider, and you probably also know that we produce some of the industry's favorite reliability tools, infrared cameras multimeters, vibration meters. But I don't know if you know that the measurements that those tools collect are now flowing automatically into several different EAMs. And the framework that allows that data to pass through is called Fluke Excelix. That would be the sponsor of today's webinar. The goal of this Fluke Excelix platform is to better connect asset management data into those existing asset management systems. And it really all turns around best practices in condition-based maintenance. That's the whole premise for this. So that's why this webinar series is focused on reliability maintenance strategies as well as technology. And today's speaker is able to talk to both sides of that picture, the reliability practice and the technology. Before the presentation though, a couple of housekeeping items. Our session is being recorded, so your phone lines are muted. You will be able to ask questions at the end of the webinar by using the question tool as part of GoToMeeting webinar. So take a moment now, find the questions button on your dashboard. If you want to type in a question as it occurs to you, please feel free. I'll take a look at it, and then when we get to the question and answer section at the end, I will read those questions out loud to Kevin. If you'd like to receive the slides from Kevin's talk today, wait until the end of the, of the webinar, take the survey, and that will automatically trigger a send of the slides to you. Okay? Otherwise, the recorded webinar will be available on Excelix.com. All right. So, today we are very pleased to have Kevin Clark, who is both a CMRP and Vice President of Excelix at Fluke. Kevin will be presenting about why connectivity is critical to an IAOT program, starting with the question of, is your facility connected? So Kevin has more than 25 years of experience in operations leadership, focused on engineering, asset management, IT, supply, manufacturing automation, and safety systems. He served as senior practice director for Proficient, where his role drove growth and success in areas of manufacturing, enterprise asset management, Internet of Things, Process Standardization, and Project Delivery. Kevin is a long-standing member of SMRP, has held vari a variety of positions at state and national levels, and has been a CMRP since 2004. He received a Bachelor of Science in Computer Integration and Manufacturing at Purdue University and an MBA from Colorado State. If you've ever heard Kevin speak before, you know that he understands daily re reality on the plant floor. And in all of his work on the IIoT, he never fails to keep a very practical perspective around what it takes for new practices to actually succeed. So today's presentation will really be a great chance to get updated on what he's seeing now. He'll be also speaking at Fluke's Accelerate Conference later this fall in Florida, and we'll talk about that at the very end. So good morning, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Leah. 
I am curious to see where our audience is at regarding the topic of today. So if you don't mind, I'm going to launch a poll for everyone to take a look at here. I want to know how big of an issue they feel connectivity is at their plant. Do they have the communications network they need to connect the assets that they want to get data from? So everyone take a moment and pick which level you feel is the most reflective of the plant issues you have right now. And Kevin, while folks are answering that, I have a question for you to kind of get things started. Sure. In the last two years, how do you think your conversations with customers have changed about connectivity? Well, uh, that conversation has changed significantly over the last couple of years. Um, you know, when you think about the generational gaps that we have and, the, mm -hmm. and who, we're, who we're building systems for these days, you know, our youth um, over the last 10 years really hasn't experienced connectivity issues. And so as they, as that, that younger generation begins to move into a plant environment, mm -hmm. um, we recognize rapidly that we as industry practitioners have significant connectivity issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what they expect as they're coming into these new roles as industrial engineers, manufacturing engineers, maintenance professionals. That's one of the first things that's, that's obvious is that we're dated when it comes to how do we connect out on the mm -hmm. plant floor. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so their, their expectation, their realization about where we're at is is becoming a hot spot in industry okay. that, that uh, we just can't accomplish connectivity the way the IoT is demanding it. Okay, so it's a mixture of we're adopting technology and it requires connectivity and we're welcoming in new folks to the plan and they expect connectivity. So it's more apparent that it's a problem than it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, and, and I think volume is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. As we continue to add and add and add yep. to our IoT on yep. the plant floor, it's becoming obvious that, that we're not prepared for it. Pushed it too far. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to close our poll and see what the folks thought. So people on the line right now feel like it's a moderate issue. About half of us, 43%, feel like it's a moderate issue. 30% are doing more than 30, almost 40% are doing great. And then 20% feel like they're having a major issue. So I'll be curious to see as you go through your presentation, your definition of connectivity compared to the folks, and then we'll check back in a little bit. But for now, I am going to turn this back over to you and uh, you can take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to the audience today. I would imagine it's morning for most out there um i think it may be afternoon for others but um i think the mass majority good morning is a uh, is an appropriate uh welcome uh we already went through leah thank you for the introduction uh that was uh, uh very good and i don't think i could really add to it so i appreciate appreciate the uh, uh the generous introduction um just real quick for the agenda um you know, there's there's an awful lot of topics and there's a lot to squeeze within the amount of time that we have today. Um, and every single um, agenda item that we have could take us into a whole separate conversation. So some of the things I wanna go through this morning is is really defining what the IIoT uh, really is. Um, and you may have your perspectives and thoughts and, and, and that. So we may hit on a few that agree and we also might hit on a few that disagree. Um, the promise of the IoT, I think a lot of people struggle with that. You know, what are the things that, that are promised in the IoT and, and isn't necessarily true? Um, our present day realities, um, getting starting, started isn't easy. We're going to talk an awful lot about that. Um, guidelines for uh, pilot programs, connectivity, uh, data systems and people. Um, not much different than uh, people, process, and technology, so that that uh, you'll be able to see some uh, some contrasting uh, views from that as well. Um, barriers to success, 
and the things that, to expect inside of a, a IoT pilot. Evolution of technology, connectivity is the key. That's where we're getting to, and then how it all comes together. So with that, we'll go ahead and, and uh, move into the um, presentation. So uh, the IoT, it's a big thing. I don't think anybody's going to disagree that it's one of those um, one of those terms that that um, could turn into a trendy term, could turn into something that isn't there in five years. Um, you know, we've had so many of these things come over the years. Uh, you know, uh, things like, uh, and I'll, I'll say this tongue in cheek, uh, you know, big data was a big thing. Um, even mobile was a big thing, but do we really call things mobile anymore? Because if everything's already mobile, does it mobile really exist? You know, and so things come about just like the IoT came about, but it is sticking and it's sticking really hard. It's, um, it means so many things to so many people because I could say artificial intelligence and immediately say it's IoT. I could say machine learning and immediately say it's IoT. Um, I could talk about the things that go on in the industrial plant, how we connect devices, and I can immediately say that's IoT. So there's a few things that I want to be able to introduce to you as we go through this presentation to help you maybe get a, a clear view of what IoT is, even though it applies to so many things. Okay, so um, if we talk about um, the IoT, um, it's best if we put it into some, some context on you know where it came from and you know some of its early foundings and and um, and why it means so much to us today and and that it's not as trendy as maybe some of these other terms have been in the past. Um, and the way I like to say the IoT. Um, why it's so big is because at the at the end of the day it's all about connecting devices and it gets a little bigger than that sometimes when you start talking about connecting people to devices or connecting people to assets um, but the industrial internet thing has everything to do with connecting devices internal to uh, a manufacturing en environment internal to um, a workspace so that it's it's IoT is what gives us the ability to connect devices. And once we've connected devices, then we're able to gather that data and do something really interesting with the data. And the really interesting part is definitely when we get to the AI and the machine learning side of the business. And I like this quote from Kevin Ashton. If you don't know who Kevin Ashton is, he back in uh, the late 90s had coined a phrase. And even Kevin admits that he didn't necessarily say it as a trend setting it just happened and and if you know if if you were around or or uh, remember the late 90s um the late 90s were just prior to y2k which had everybody completely freaked out about data um and um crashing of systems and time stamping and some other things that were just going to end the world um so just prior to that um, he was talking about the internet and he called it the internet of things. And he said this, and this is, this is one of the quotes that I like the best from Kevin is the best artists, scientists, engineers, inventors, entrepreneurs, and other creators are the ones who keep taking steps to, by finding new problems, new solutions, and then problems again. So, you know, we've, we've already dealt with the connectivity problem before, and now it's a problem again. And it will be a problem again, but we continue to to improve it. We continue to focus in on it when things change. And the IoT absolutely made things change in our industry. So then we talk about the promises of the IoT. Um, we we all know that that um, condition monitoring, predictive technologies, um, even the basics of maintenance where we're just gathering meter readings, not necessarily with the intent of, of monitoring them, but using that data to do something interesting with. Um, we know that there are um, things that slow down an IoT process. Um, 
and IoT has made promises that it can deliver. And in a lot of ways it does, and in so many ways it doesn't. So the promise that many vendors promise their method of implementation will lead to a smooth IoT implementation and to real, reliability nirvana. Um, we're gonna go through some things that, that will uh, conflict with that statement. Um, and it, it doesn't change anything that we know about how we do project management, how we change cultures, how we um, deploy technology. It doesn't go against that. It, in fact, it will ring true in a lot of minds about how we change. And the challenge is how does one keep the real goal in mind by increasing our business value with MNR, uh, within NMR uh, without jumping into a risky, expensive boondoggle project that may not produce results. You know, and since I've been in this business for over 30 years now, I've watched a lot of that happen where we had a return on investment, but the rest of technology, the rest of our space wasn't ready for that technology or that technology wasn't as mature as you'd hoped it would be. And so achieving the return on investment that we really thought we would get out of that technology is incredibly difficult to achieve. So a little bit about the reality um, in the market. Um, so I don't know if any of you experience it, but I've definitely experienced it and saw it and lived it and, and everything else, but slow moving pilot projects. Um, so I thought this was interesting um, that only 20% of pilot IoT programs have successfully rolled out in facilities. You think about it, that's one in five projects successfully rolled out in facilities. And my guess is might be a little high. Um, what we've become in this world a little bit is is pilot crazy. And so you'll see some of the things as we move forward in these slides that that pilots in some in some regards help define what our strategy is for our company or our site um, going forward for IoT. Well, if that's how we're building strategy for IoT and only 20% of those are successful, what are the 80% doing that have failed IOTs and strategy? So I thought it was an interesting uh, uh, percentage um, and what is the view of IOT after a failed IOT project? Um, increasing complexity. So 50% of MNRTs look at the start, look to start IOT CBM programs, find the process of integrating existing systems too complex. Yeah, welcome to my world. It is a it is a complex world. It is um, um, it is very difficult to understand. I I'm always amazed at how many people just don't even understand what um, IoT um, really means, and they're in the midst of an IoT project. Um, so this number doesn't shock me um, that they think it's too complex. Um, I have a tendency to move people back towards the simplicity before they get too terribly complex um, and build more of a platform. And a lot of times we don't see that. We see pilots that are incredibly complex um, that have probably little chance of succeeding. And then additional skills needed. So 50% of the MNR leaders um, recognize consulting and training and support is needed to help augment team skills. So that's our gap um, in our connected teams. So when, when you look at these percentages and the gaps in connected data and the gaps in connected systems and the ga gaps in connected teams, it starts to culminate and you start to look at this as, is it really possible to even do that? Even deploy an IoT system without running into some kind of barrier someplace that's going to stop me or slow me down from being successful with IoT. So understanding this, understanding the, the, the reality of the IoT um, is really our next step to a connected reliability strategy. So we've broken it down a little different, you know, and I brought it up earlier about the people process and technology and, and 
so this is the way we've really grown to uh, live in the space of IoT uh, from a fluke perspective. And, and we see data, connecting data um, as incredibly important. We see uh, connecting systems as incredibly important. And we see connecting teams as really important. So the the way we look at these things have all changed a little bit, right? So um, connecting data isn't just one medium. It's just not one protocol. It's just not one thing. It's so many things, right? And so we look at the silos out there of data. I was in a conversation uh, earlier this week at a client in California, and we were discussing connectivity. And we were discussing all the silos they have built into their systems and and where we're gonna put that data and how we're gonna get it there. And by the end of the conversation, just to um, shorten a very long conversation that we had, was at the end of the conversation, we were jokingly um, referring to connected silos. You know, as we, as we move forward uh, in the connected reliability world, connected silos is really what it's all about. How do I get data that's stuck over in a silo someplace and put it someplace um, where we can actually use the data? Um, and it, the same goes the same with, with systems. It's not just about the data, it's about the systems that we're connecting. And so um, I don't think anybody's gonna be successful if they say, I have to replace all my systems in order to get IoT. Nobody's gonna get that, that, uh, that blessing from upper management that they can go s spend the billions of dollars um, to just go do that. So we, from a successful standpoint, IoT, you wanna look at all of your systems and how do we bring our existing systems together to, to create a more IoT-like environment. And then Teams is a little different because not only does our team consist of everybody that's on our team physically as a human being, but also as the assets out on the plant floor. So in order for this to be successful, you have to look at your equipment as part of the team and how do we all work together to get to the end product. So barriers um, with IoT projects. Um, you know, this, this list could get really long and what we've done is tried to narrow it down as much as we possibly could um, to what are the big things that are really slowing us down with IoT projects. One is getting in your own way, doing things that, that, uh, that are inhibiting you as a leader or even you as a participant in an IoT project, um, you come in with your own views, your own perspectives. Um, you can easily get in your own way. The next one is too many options facing you. So when you really look at the, the, the global opportunity for options, um, it is daunting. Um, even for somebody that lives in the IoT like I do every day, it is daunting. And then your expectations are too high. So there's a there's a degree of level setting that needs to happen and understanding in order to set achievable um, goals and expectations. And then the, the last one is the cloud should just work, right? And so I, I can't get a physical um, raise of hands, but how many of you have got clouds that didn't quite work the way you expected them to? And we're going to go over that just a little bit. So barrier number one, and we're going to have a little bit of fun with this because this uh, this goes a little bit back to each and every one on the phone. Um, and this, this, this was written for me um, and the things that I've experienced over the last 30 years and watching technology go from almost zero to what we are today. Um, and the number one barrier in my career over the years has always been me and the notions that I, or the notions and the walls and the preconceived um, expectations of what I've already done, right? And so I tried it 20 years ago and it didn't work. And so something gets locked in your brain of trying to go around that thing that you tried 20 years ago because you don't want to make the same mistake. And many times, especially as technology advances, you have to let your brain advance too and the things that you learned and you almost have to go try them again. Um, but you have that you have that that knowledge in your head of yeah, I'm going to go try it again, but here's what I'm going to watch out for. 
and I understand the needs of the next generation, and I put in parentheses not because most of us don't. So we've probably got all generations on this call, uh, but the folks that are building these systems, that are approving these systems, that had the vision for the future, are generally going to be your boomers and your Xers, and maybe some Ys in there. And who we're building the who we're building the system for is likely our Z generation. The ones that have different expectations than maybe those of us that are building and, and are improving them. The other one is I understand all my options in the IoT. So some of us will go out and we'll research four, five, six, maybe 10 organizations and try to figure out which, which organization um, might fit best inside of your, your, your particular situation. Um, and I think maybe as we go through here, you'll, you'll figure out that, you know, your options are much larger than what you researched. And I'm looking for a mature IoT solution. Um, well, I'm here to tell you, um, we, we are potentially one of the most mature on the market and we are not mature. Uh, we're on a journey just like you are um, at Fluke. And so IoT is changing daily for us. What we thought was our strategy last week this week, we might have bumped into a new technology that might change the way we look at our strategy. So our strategy has to be far looking and directionally correct, but it, it can change multiple times and iterations within that long uh, vision. Another one that's challenging is um, the cultural behaviors. Um, so we're locked in cultures. Um, and so we have certain ways of doing things in certain expectations and there most of those are unwritten um, that may be the single largest battle that you have um, is culture and we know culture um, generally wins when strong process is not considered when strategy is not followed when um, when the business is dictated by that culture um, culture generally wins and the last one is just your own confidence in your own self. You've got to be careful of those because sometimes we say, I got this and you run off in a direction and the next thing you know, technology wins and says, nope, you don't got this. There's a lot of other options that you should have looked at, another way to deploy, another way to spend your valuable uh, dollars and you don't got this. And so that's, um, this is, this is my personal list. This is the list that I've experienced over all of these years. And this is my list of watch outs. Don't let, don't let yourself get in front of success. Barrier number two, this one's pretty easy to go through. I think you'll get this uh, pretty quick. So um, this is a slide loaded up with uh, artificial intelligence um, startups. So I think this just brings my point to options um, to a head. Um, and they do count like ant colonies. Um, and then as you're, as you're looking through them and you're trying to figure out which direction I would go, you, would, you start to find out that the differentiation between each one of them is incredibly small. Um, and then the other thing is that this landscape just changes incredibly fast. Um, I, I watch acquisitions. I watch companies that just kind of disappear. Um, I watch companies that just, they start, but they never go anywhere. They're out there and they've got that one client or two clients, and, and, but they just never really go anywhere. Um, and then they all have claims, right? They're all an end to end solution. They're all smart. They all have high adoption rates and, and, and then they're all cost effective and have a strong return on investment. Um, you know, the only last thing I want to say about this slide, because I, I think it speaks for itself, is that slide there in particular, and I know most of you can't read it, um, but it's only Israel's artificial intelligence startup companies. That's just Israel. So if you were to do a map of, of how many startups there are in the US and how many startups there are in Europe and, and South America and, and you know, it would just be a colorful screen, an incredibly colorful screen. And we would have difficulty um, making any kind of decisions based on that kind of an option. 
Expectations. Um, so some of the expectations come from a lack of knowledge. Um, and, and I hate to say this part too. Some expectations come from too much knowledge. And so you get to the point where you let all of that knowledge get to you. Um, the next thing you know, you have a very detailed, difficult to achieve um, list of expectations. But internally, um, one of the biggest problems we have is that the answer to all of my asset management issues is the IIoT. Um, I can't tell, how, tell you how often I've been on a phone call or a client visit where the client said, my VP said, go do IoT. That's the direction. That's the expectation is go do IoT. And IoT is assumed to be the solution. Not thinking about culture, not thinking about processes that don't work, not thinking about assets that are not being predicted, not thinking about any of that, just go do IoT. Um, IoT is the future. I have to do this, right? So that's an expectation. And so, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. We're, we're, we, we like to win. We don't like to lose. So what do we do? We just go say, I'm, I got to do this. So I'm, I'm going to go find IoT. And I'm going to do it. And you got to be very careful of that uh, because that'll take you down a path because I just got to go do it. I got to, I got to get the check in the box. Um, that's on my, uh, review. So I have to get it done. Um, and now that we're so far into IoT, all of a sudden software doesn't fail. And I think that it's, it's such an interesting dynamic that that's, that's come about because of IoT is we forgot that all the things that software had failed at. Um, you know, we forgot that software has bugs. We forgot that software is, is something that's constantly moving, constantly improving, constantly um, changing because the environment is changing. There's new connections, there's new features. Um, and every time you bring out a new feature, every time you have a new connection, there's also a, a potential for failure. And so software is still software and hardware is still hardware. Um, we still have in the industry, the potential of failing, even though it's considered um, a software at risk or a hardware at risk. At Fluke, we like to say we don't have those, but in general, it's still software and still hardware. Uh, preventative maintenance is a thing of the past. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard this. I don't know how many maintenance professionals we have on the call, but preventative maintenance is not a thing of the past. Matter of fact, it is preventative maintenance is even more of a topic today because of technology, because of the things we can now do. Like 30 years ago, things that I wanted to do then, we just couldn't do. There was just not possible. The connectivity wasn't there. The, the technology wasn't there. Um, and even the maturity of individuals, people wasn't there. We couldn't accept this kind of technology. It would have just, it would have made our head explode. So preventative maintenance is actually doing something different and becoming what it ought to be rather than disappearing. Predictive maintenance is now easy. Just turn it on. So instead of predictive maintenance, I like to use the term predictive technologies, condition monitoring, but it's not now easy. Um, it is now possible, um, but it's not easy. You still have to go back and build strategy. You still have to go back and do the things that, that you would normally do when you're preparing for something new, whether it's a process, whether it's, whether it's bringing new people on board, you still have to have all the infrastructure built to prepare that person, to prepare that process uh, to be deployed. And then flawless execution, this is still technology. It is still a project. Flawless execution is dependent upon you and the preparation that you make. It is not because now the technology is perfect, it's going to execute flaw flawlessly. This is always an interesting conversation. So cloud, I've been in cloud for a lot of years now. Uh, matter of fact, it was been 19 years ago, uh, tried to deploy cloud technologies at Johnson & Johnson. Um, at the beginning, they liked the idea. And then as it got closer to IT, the, it was squashed immediately. 
Um, and that leads me to the first question, which is, uh, I would say 75% of the time, this is a question that we get from a client, whether it's talking about um, our uh, handheld technology or our sensor technology or or our CMMS technology, the question always comes around, can this be on-prem? And if it's on-prem, can you still manage it like you do as a cloud? Um, I think in many situations, the, the answers to those questions are no and no. Um, cloud is becoming um, the thing. It's becoming what we do, not necessarily so that it gets out of your premises, but so that it's manageable, so that it's it's being fed and nurtured or nurtured and and just taken care of on a consistent basis and and helps your organization to do things in a very standard and pragmatic way. So the answer isn't always no, um, but it's becoming a more common uh, answer than just yes, because I think we all um, know what the challenges are with on-prem, even though regulatory bodies and, and some of the other um, high-tech organizations struggle to accept a cloud, it's all changing. So security is a high concern on cloud. Yep, it is a high concern, absolutely a high concern. Um, with my experience in cloud, I believe we're becoming, we're coming to an era where cloud is actually more secure than on-prem. We're seeing this with a lot of the attacks and, and that on systems in organizations. And the first thing cloud thinks about these days is how do I keep this data safe? Um, and sometimes in our organizations, it's not the first thing we think about. Um, because our business is generally the first thing we think about. And so I think you're, you're seeing a paradigm shift there where it's going to go the other way. It's becoming more of a security issue that my systems are on-prem. And so I think, I think that's beginning to take care of itself. Now, this next one is, is interesting. And this is, this is something that I've come to grips with uh, personally. You know, when I have organizations out there that that talk to me about cloud and and moving to cloud, and um, they're excited about the potential of it, but they also know the barriers. They know that their organization will or will not do a particular thing in the cloud. Um, we have organizations that says we're going 100% to the cloud, and they're still maybe 25% of the way. Uh, even though they've missed their goal of being 100% to the cloud. And there's just so many barriers to cloud that that you know keep people up at night. But how many of your kids are terribly worried about their data on Xbox or out on social media? That's the generation we have coming behind um, the boomers and the Xers are the folks that are that are more inclined to the cloud and less inclined to on-premise solutions. And so that's why I say cloud adoption is high, but the acceptance is not so high. Where we, we're all kind of speaking the same language of moving towards the cloud. But when you look at the numbers and, and how fast and, and, and how much of our systems are in the cloud, it doesn't line up. <clears throat> and then too many clouds. And one, the example I like to use here is, is you know we all experience a few clouds. Matter of fact, I'm sitting here in Indiana today and we've got a few clouds, so it's a partly cloudy day. When I get too many clouds, um, what does that bring? It typically brings storms, and it's 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 a parallel that actually works pretty well. Once I get so many clouds out there, it starts to get crazy, and how my data connects from one cloud to the next cloud to the next cloud to the next cloud, and that's when you bring that conversation of complex back into back into what we're doing from an IoT standpoint. And it can it be on another cloud, right? So if, if we've got a, a bunch of fluke uh, clouds out there that are collecting data, and then we have clients that ask, can we put it on another cloud? That begins to make things difficult again. So what we try to do, I think, is, as uh, as suppliers to the industry and the need of cloud is we we try to 
create an environment of standardization within the clouds that we use and how we deploy those clouds so that so that it does easily connect to the next one and the next one. I think the last one is, I won't spend much time on this because I know it's sensitive, is job security. Some of the cloud adoption has been related to job security because the minute I go to a bunch of clouds, I have less need for particular folks that manage those clouds uh, or manage that technology internally. And so we've all we've all seen that and and uh, we've all felt it as well. You know, so it's it, but it is a it is a a barrier for going to the cloud without a doubt. So Leah, I think we have a question we wanted to ask. We do, because I want to take you, you've been painting connectivity in a potentially a different way than some folks have thought about it. Um, so I want people to take a minute and decide what percentage of their machines are connected. So not necessarily we were talking about, you know, are your clouds connected, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, very specifically, what percentage of your machines are connected? Okay, I'm seeing some people work on this while we while folks answer i'm going to do a time check we've got 20 minutes left kevin so okay. keep that in mind because i know you've got Will some do. good stuff coming i'm going to give it just another couple of seconds while people make their selection here what percentage of your company's machines are connected zero percent 25 50 75 or for those who are perfect 100 percent all right, that looks pretty good. So, 50%, no, 19% of the people on the call feel like they have 50% of their machines connected. 40% or 38% of the people on the call feel like they have about a quarter of their machines connected. And there are 3% of the people on the phone who think that they have 100% connected, Kevin. Wow, okay. What do you do about that? All right. <laughs> Great. Well, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, but b before we dig into that, let's let's talk about pilots. So we've built up to the point where we talked about pilots and the challenges of doing a pilot, uh, the ch challenges of doing IoT. Um, you know, I I have I have the luxury of of raising children that went into this space in the IoT space and the maintenance and reliability space. And so I, I I also have the luxury of watching the differences between Ys and Z, Zs and how they look at technology. And I have you know just a quick way to to start this off is we as Xers and Boomers have been uh, doing technology for a long time. We grew up you know in an, in a, a disconnected world um, and but we matured in a connected world or a world trying to be connected. And so we've been doing technology for a long time. Matter of fact, that's that's so evident in our siloed systems. That's that's people doing um, doing digital, not necessarily being digital. Your Ys and your Zs generally grew up being digital. So everything they did with their Xboxes and, and their Playstations and, and all of their social media, that was them being digital. So they lived it, they experienced it. And so it's just completely different perspectives on, on, on how we came up versus how they came up. And the biggest thing to remember is those of us that are making decisions for our businesses today need to consider what the Ys and the Zs expect in technology and expect in their systems because that's who we're building our systems for. So when we think about those pilots, um, when we think about pilots, we know that it's an experiment, a test. Many times we expect things out of a pilot that really shouldn't be there. If we can't go into a pilot with an experimental, experiential and experimental um, mindset, we will probably set the wrong expectations for that pilot. And I know because of the many pilots that we've done and the many pilots that we're doing, I know that 
so many of those pilots were set with inaccurate and probably unachievable expectations. So I just want to make sure that we get off on the right foot here that, and that a pilot is considered to be an experiment or a test of capabilities and what could be, okay? So this is a list that I can't, kind of came up with, you know, as me being a creative, I'm not necessarily creative all the time. And, but I, I was able to put a whole bunch of E words to doing a pilot, an IOT pilot. So education, this one is so, so important because of the education that we don't have in IoT. And what I said was the best way to guarantee understanding and adoption is to ensure everyone is properly trained. And so properly trained is a moving target at the moment, uh, just, just so that uh, I'm clear on that. that. That target changes because of what we're educating and how we're educating. And I'll, I got another slide that'll give you a little bit more insight on what the, I'm talking about here in a little bit. And an experiment, you and your vendors, that's that's the absolute mindset you have to go into this with is it cannot be customer vendor pilot and think that it's going to come out successful. It has to be a partnership. It has to be the two of you going into this with the intent of learning. And that if that vendor tells you that they're not planning to learn something from your pilot, then you're probably going down the wrong path with that vendor because we are learning every single pilot we go through, we are learning how to make our products a little bit better or back them up a little bit and start again in a different direction. So we learn every time. Expectations, the most important attribute of a success file is to have a measurable goal. I, I will always talk about expectations when it comes to IoT pilots because we are generally never right on expectations. We've, we generally start too high. And then as it goes through the pilot, you're having to back that expectation up. And then the letdown at the end of that pilot is insurmountable. And then everyone. So get everyone involved that needs to be involved. We all know that transparency inside of a project, inside of defining a pilot, creates, the, um, creates learning and a vision from everyone involved. And everybody feels like they have a, some skin in the game. Um, and to elevate, to make sure that we get this out to everybody that needs to know it. As soon as we run into a problem or we don't meet an expectation, it needs to go to everybody quickly, not shoved under the rug because we want this to be successful, but elevate it quickly. Execute is no different than any other pilot, whether it's technology or what it is, is, is to execute. Um, so project timing, um, meeting milestones, um, dealing with the things that weren't delivered, all of those need to be um, dealt with um, and executed flawlessly. And then the, the, the last one, which could easily be the first one, is executive, and that's top-down support, making sure that, that at the highest levels that this is approved, everybody understands what we're doing, um, but we need to make sure that that communication is across the board all the way up to the executives. Um, because generally an IoT pilot um, has high visibility. And so you want to make sure that that executive is on, on the same page at all times. So Kevin. Yes. In our last 10 minutes here, what are the most important things that you want people to take away? Let's pick and choose what we've got left here. Okay. Um, I've got some slides I can move through pretty quickly. Um, so if you want to just do it that way, I will. <laughs> I want your I highlight. do it that highlight. way. I want the most, because I know you've got some things that people can take away. So let's, yep. let's get to those. Okay. okay, let's do that. So our findings, IoT strategy is often formed from the results of a pilot. Um, I think many of you might be experiencing that. The only project, IoT project you have going on is the one that you're working on and that becomes your IoT strategy. A pilot is an experiment. It's an agreement to try IoT and test against expectations. So we need to make sure that that is um, the case. So here's, here's one that I really want to do, Leah. I want to make sure that everybody gets this one because it's important to understand this as we get into, um, okay. as we get into pilots. 
is that 82%, and this is information that I got from Purdue University while we were doing a study together, 82% of all manufacturing jobs will soon require medium to high digital skills levels. 82%. 82%, right. So all do the math on that one of all manufacturing jobs will Damn. require medium to high. One in six American uh, working Americans don't know how to use email, internet, or have basic digital skills. So think about the two of those together um, and how they conflict with one another. And then the, the biggest point there for the, the uh, digital skills is that private industry training and investment is down 30% in the last 10 years, that which tells us we're not. Yeah, which which tells us that we're not only are we lacking in some digital skills, we are also not training appropriately for this new age coming on us. And that gets to what we can do. Got it. Yep. And then the last one, I think that lots of people don't understand this one too, but it's one in five executives believe digital transformation yeah. projects are a waste of time. That's yeah. that's a tough one. That's twenty percent. Well. Yep. Um, so, and then I, I think the last one is, is really important. All, inv all involved are on a journey. And I can't make that more clear um, than I'm making now is the fact that, that not only are you on a journey trying to figure out how you're going to get your facilities up and running in an IoT situation, but also um, how your suppliers, your vendors, <coughs> excuse me, are on the same journey. Mm-hmm. So let me get past this. <laughs> let me get past this. I just want to, I'm flipping through. I don't want to be messing with everybody's eyes. So I think this one here is probably where we can about end this to keep in, in time here. So <clears throat> this goes, this takes us full circle back to connectivity. And I think the biggest point here is that um, we've identified a failure point within organizations. And I know listening to the, the results of how connected you are, um, I think there's, I think picking moderate is a safe answer. Um, what we find generally is most organizations will pick moderate before we have a conversation with them. And it's the unknowns that tend to get us when having a critical asset over in an area where we can't get to it. <clears throat> and I can tell you today, you're gonna see less and less wired systems. So if that answer had anything to do with wired uh, connectivity, um, it's probably gonna drop your answer down um, because wired is, um, not a technology is going to disappear, but it is it is going to be less of a solution for those of us that are in an industrial setting. You're going to see an awful lot of uh, wireless connectivity in the future. And that's that's part of getting yourself educated on what's coming down the pike versus where I'm at today. So getting that connectivity and getting our data where it needs to be is incredibly important. System connectivity is also part of the answer. So we have systems, especially in the maintenance and reliability space, we might have reliability solutions that help us with things like Weibel analysis and Vineet Mika's and, and that. And I can, I can guarantee most of those are not connected. They're generally standalone. Even if they're enterprise systems, they're generally standalone. Um, so getting our systems connected like our EAMs and our CMMS is connected out to our assets. So we have real time feedback and then that feedback is then readily accessible to the people that are actually taking care of that asset. And that, that connectivity isn't just, do I have Wi-Fi? It isn't just, do I have mobile uh, capabilities? This isn't just, is my system enterprise wide? It has so many variables that, that would determine whether or not you have good connectivity. And that's really your point is that we need to be a little, we need to dig a little deeper into the idea of what connective means and that we're not That's as ready correct. as we think we are because the requirements for what we're trying to do are deeper. Much deeper, much yep. deeper, right? So we have a lot of walls to break down, right? And they may be physical walls, they may be virtual walls, um, they may be discussing is on-prem the right approach for me mm -hmm. or do I need to 
completely change my infrastructure and go to the cloud. Okay. So you know, all those questions need to be dealt with. And then the last piece is the team's connectivity. And that's getting people into the technology. You know, I talked a little bit earlier about the generational gaps. And those of us that are the Xers and the boomers, we have to, we have to force ourselves to be digital because it, we weren't born digital. But the Ys and the Zs were born digital, and they really get the fact that that um, equipment, software, internet is part of their being, and that's just the way they grew up. And so it's much easier for them to feel like they're in a team that includes equipment, that includes software, than it is for those of us that were born doing digital. So I want to make sure that I got those out. Mm -hmm. And I know we did run a little short on time here. Um, Let's do a little train the trainer. So for the slides that we're not able to talk to, can you give us a 30 seconds on what this slide is? Because people get a copy of the deck afterwards. So for example, what is this slide talking to? Yeah, that's why I moved to this slide is I thought that maybe we ought to talk about this one. I, <laughs> I love this slide. I love this slide because it breaks it all down. All the things that we're talking about connectivity, because we can, we can, we can twist that term any way we want to. But when we break it back down to what do the people on this call work with each and every day, mm -hmm. this helps you see IoT, how it fits in the middle of asset monitoring and maintenance optimization. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. many of us have had sensors and actuators and cameras and proximity uh, beacons and sensors for a long, long time. That's mm -hmm actually mm -hmm. would be put in old technology category. <laughs> right? We've been doing that for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've also been doing maintenance op optimization for a long time. We're getting mm -hmm. better at it these days than we were 20 years ago, but we've been doing that. And what mm -hmm. makes it different is when you throw the IoT analytics in the middle of it, right? Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. you're beginning to connect things that we've already been doing for a very long time back into IoT. And so it gives us a whole different view of how we can do the same things that we've been doing, but we can do them so much better. The, but the premise of this talk that we're having right now is, are we ready? Mm -hmm. And that connectivity is really at the root of mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. we need to be ready for. Yep. Okay. So I think you have some final thoughts for us. Yep. Yep. So you, you'll be able to go back through this presentation. You'll be able mm -hmm. to dig mm -hmm. into it a little bit and and um, and understand kind of the direction that I'm coming from, what I'm seeing out there in industry. And you have two basic options and obviously there's more, it's more complex than just these two options, but it really does get categorized into the two ways of doing this. And it's when you have the option of either leveraging your in-house knowledge to set up a pilot program on your own, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's as long as you have all the, infrastructure built in that says I can go do it on my own and I can do it well on my own. There's lots of tools out there that can help you do that. There's lots of organizations you can benchmark. There's there's lots of things that you can do on your own to go do it. Um, but just remember that everything we talked about in this presentation is even more real if you do it on your own. Um, the, the other option is to go out and get a connected reliability assessment. And that means somebody would come in and help you get a jump start. Somebody that's seen it, done it, not only from a technology standpoint, but also from an expert in maintenance and reliability that sees this stuff day in and day out, is in a constant chain of, of being trained and relearning and relearning and relearning, um, would come in and could help you uh, set the baseline. That helps you with the expectations, that helps you with flawless execution, that helps you with all the other things about what what do I really need? What problem am I trying to solve with this IoT? And that way you can really dig down in and, and identify the, the uh, technologies you need and then also the partners that you need to get it done. Um, so the second option is to do the connected reliability assessment or find uh, from Fluke or go find another connected reliability um, expert that can help you. Can I extrapolate that you're being asked to do that? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense because a lot of what you pointed out as a barrier are all very subjective things that are very hard to see from your own two feet perspective. And some of those things may only come to light when you have somebody else objectively looking at it. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it does. It does shine a different light on it for sure. Yep. Yep. Okay. We got a couple of questions in that we're probably not going to have time to really uh, address. The only one, let's see. Um, how far into the future do you think the walls will come down? So obviously we're working at this. Um, do you feel like, I'm trying to figure out how to give you a constructive way to answer this question. Um, I, I think I, I think I can get it, Leah. Okay. Um, so to answer the question, I think in, in some industries they've come down really, really fast in other industries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and while they're going through it, while those fast industries um, are are bringing down the walls, they're also knocking down the barriers, right? Okay. So you've got all this, all the vendors that are learning from that. When when they knock down barriers, they're learning what barriers that they're going to run into, and then they can help the next client to be even more rapid yep. at bringing those walls down. Yep. So I, it's I don't think it's very far. I I okay. honestly think that we're going to see some massive stuff happening over the next five years for sure. Well, speaking of massive, the next question is, will 5G uh, help or hurt this issue, right? So when we have this massive unlock of all this high bandwidth low latency, what's that going to do to this situation? Well, yes, um, <laughs> because there's so many things that we're not doing today because we mm -hmm. can't. Because we can't, right? we don't have, yeah, we we don't have the edge computing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when we think about it, when we think about work orders going through the system, we think about, you know, a sensor picking up data every, you know, minute, 90 seconds and sending that back to the system. That's not high volume traffic. That's not mm -hmm. things that we need to really nope. worry about, but it's, it's all the things that we could be doing yep. inside of that asset and really understanding the heartbeat of it, sending those really precise vibration signals um, in a real time way rather, rather than, you know, a minute frequency. Yep. Um, we learn so much more about an asset than we do um, by having to separate that that send of so you data. Think that that bandwidth really is going to make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, the bandwidth and, will be huge. Undoubtedly, it'll be a little painful as this person is is predicting because it's going to be yet another change, right? And yet another connect connectivity expectation that we're all going to have to react around. Right. We'll solve the connectivity issue, but we'll have a different one. Mm -hmm, future, exactly, and then it'll be a different one. Right. If you will forward through the slides one more time here, so keep going forward. All right, so there's your contact oh, information. If you go back, mm -hmm. Kevin Clark. Yep. At fluke.com, and folks are are welcome to contact you directly if they want to. Absolutely. Okay, and then there's that URL there if they want more information about what your team is recommending for the connected reliability assessment. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then that's our landing you're, page. You're going to be speaking uh, at Accelerate next month, right? Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of things that I'm doing from a from a workshop standpoint and, and yeah. that, but not necessarily speaking on, let's say, this topic. Well, right. But so I will, you'll forward I will to be the very next... engaged at, at Accelerate. <laughs> if you'll forward to the next slide. Yep. Um, because people may not know that this is happening, but uh, or it's less than a month now. Um, so Accelerate 19 is an old comers for maintenance and reliability, and many of these topics will be taken apart in much more detail there in the workshops. So have a look um, for Accelerate 19. If you Google that, you will find all the information. And then uh, when I close out this presentation here, this webinar here with Kevin, you should automatically be served up a survey option. So if everybody on the line wants to complete that survey, you will then automatically receive a copy of the slides from Kevin today. And as he said, if there are things that he didn't get to and you want to ping him afterward, he's at kevin.clark at fluke.com. And you can also go back to excelix.com and look at the replay webinars because we'll have this posted within the next day or so. So that's it, Kevin. Thank you very much for your time this morning. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Leah. Appreciate the time. Okay, everyone have a wonderful day and thank you for joining us.